OK, welcome to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, looks like we have a bunch of people here already and a lot of questions to go through. So uh, if anyone wants to get started, feel free to go ahead and grab the first question. Yeah, so in terms of the disavow, yeah, so uh, um, once you submit all the sites, somebody has their, I'm hearing an echo of mine. Uh, there's, um, so once you submit all the domains uh, and everything's fine and you feel that uh, the lift has been removed and so forth, uh, do you need to empty the list or should it be there? Should the links just continue to be there for a certain period of time? Um, so the links are essentially only disavowed as long as they're in the disavow file. So if you remove them after some point, then essentially when we recrawl and reprocess those URLs and there's no disavow file left for that domain, then we will treat those as normal links again. So if you remove them, essentially you're returning them to the normal state. And if they were problematic links in the past, then they'd be problematic links again. OK. Thank so you. you probably, usually, you'd want to keep the disavow file and uh, just keep adding to that over time as, as you see fit. OK, thanks. All right. Um, let's grab a question from the moderator page here. Uh, imagine we have a site widgets.com hit by Panda with inner page slash blue. We work hard on improving the site's content. How can Google know the quality of slash blue has been improved if they have no user metrics as the page gets no traffic from Google? So essentially, as far as I know, Panda is a site-wide algorithm, so it's not something that would be specific to one particular page. So we look at the website overall and the website's quality overall by using a variety of signals. And based on that, we make the decision uh, from time to time as we update the Panda algorithm to see how we would uh, treat the quality of that content there. So if you're working on significantly improving your site's quality overall, then that's something that uh, this algorithm will generally pick up on over time as well. So it's not something where we'd have to check it on a per page basis. We really look at uh, the website overall. Uh, let's see, we have a question here in chat already. Um, we migrated our old domain to our new company's uh, domain. Back in September, we still see over 0.5 million URLs indexed from the old domain. And for the last two months, the number of the URLs from the, of the old domain are increasing. Why does this happen when we have properly set up 301 redirects? Um, essentially, that can happen. It, it can take quite a while for those kind of uh, site changes to actually actually be picked up everywhere. And uh, one thing you really need to keep in mind is we need to actually crawl and uh, reprocess those redirects uh, from time to time. So that's not something that uh, you'd want to remove over time or you'd uh, like block Googlebot with a robot text file or anything like that. I'm not sure specifically uh, about the site itself. We can take a quick look. Um, I imagine this new redirect, though. Um, can you post the old domain name in the chat? Then maybe we can take a quick look. OK. So sometimes what, what I've seen uh, people do is uh, like use robots to try to block the indexing of the old pages. And the problem there is that we wouldn't be able to pick up the content and the redirects. So in this case, it looks like these are all like fairly lower level pages, just uh, randomly from a first guess here. So I imagine this is something where we're essentially still crawling through all of those redirects to actually recognize that uh, those things have changed. So that's something that probably just takes time. 
And uh, that's usually not something that would be in any way problematic in the sense that uh, this is not something where you'd uh, need to have all of these URLs moved over to the new domain name. We'll generally treat your website accordingly, even if it's shown with the URL from the old domain name. So that's not really something where you'd say, oh, this is a critical problem that you have to solve right away. Um, I have a short slide here, which might help uh, kind of understand it a little bit more. Um, so looking at this, uh, essentially there is, are a small number of pages where we, which we crawl very frequently, where we pick up the changes very quickly. So that would generally be your home page or your main category pages or pages where we've seen that changes happen fairly frequently. But uh, the large bulk of the pages on a website is something where we crawl the pages very infrequently. So that can be months, that can be half a year, that can be longer than that even, until we actually recrawl all of these individual pages here. And this is essentially where a lot of your content is, because that's something that changes very rarely. So we usually don't have to recrawl them very frequently. And what happens with a site-wide redirect is that we essentially go down from here, and we start crawling and processing the redirects for each of these individual sections. And some of these will get picked up very quickly. Some of the archive will be picked up as well. But there's still this large bulk here that changes very rarely. So that's something where any kind of changes, like redirects or title changes or content changes, they just take a lot of time to actually be crawled and processed again. Especially um, for a lot of pages, right? Sorry? Especially for a lot of pages, if the site has thousands and thousands of pages, it, uh, it's slower. It's a slower process, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is something where we try to find a fixed crawl speed for each server. And based on that, we try to update the, the home pages very frequently. And some of the lower level pages, essentially, we kind of have to crawl when we have time. And sometimes that can take a bit, quite a bit of time. Uh, how long will these pages be recrawled? Um, we essentially recrawl them regularly. So that's something where even if we've seen a redirect, we'll try to get back to that every now and then to just kind of double check that the redirect's still there, that there's not any uh, other content on that URL now that we have to crawl and index, especially when we run into new links to those pages. So that's something where we'll just regularly try to recrawl those pages from time to time and just double check to see that we're not missing anything. So John, in, uh, in Yanis's case, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. So in his case, how long would it take, uh, there's a big uh, debate out there, for him to get all the PR uh, back from his you know, older domain to the new one? What, what would you think? Like, is that like a seven to eight months kind of to get all the juice from the old to the new? Um, that's not really something where there's any fixed timeline or anything specific that you'd want to be looking for there. So especially when you're talking about page rank, that's something that's on a per page basis. So as we recrawl and recrawl, reprocess those individual pages, we'll kind of uh, pass the page rank as we move to the other URL. So uh -huh. that's on a per page basis anyway. So it's not something where you really have to um, worry about how long does it take until Google transfers everything to the new domain. That's something that's done on a per page basis there. And what if you have URLs who are crawled uh, even years after? Uh, when, when do they, you know, the old URLs disappear? Uh, we have a big memory. So we um, can keep track of a lot of the old URLs. And especially when we find that there are any kind of new links pointing to those pages, or when we suspect there are new links pointing to those pages, we'll retry them again. So that's something that can happen after a couple of years, even, uh, where if we've seen content there in the past, then we might try it again at some point in the future again. Uh, for example, on my site, I still see uh, Google crawling websites from 2007. 
that many years back? That, that can happen, yeah. That, that can definitely happen. Um, usually what helps a little bit is if you use the proper HTTP results codes, like a, a 410 instead of a 404 or instead of a 200 for pages that don't exist anymore. That's a strong signal for us that this content really is gone. But that still doesn't mean that we'll never recrawl it again. So we might try it again after a couple of months or even after a couple of years to just double check to see if we're not missing anything important. And that's not a bad sign. So if you see that we're recrawling old URLs that used to return 404 that still return 404, then that's not something you need to fix or you need to worry about there. That's perfectly normal. But it makes it difficult to find new problems, because in the Webmaster tools, you see all the old ones, and you can't uh, get rid of them. So it's much more difficult to find new problems just because the old ones keep keeps popping up. Um, that's that's definitely the case. So in Webmaster Tools, we try to sort the crawl errors by uh, importance. So if there's something that we think is a really important page that now has a 404, then that's something we'll show on top of the list. But if you, the first page of your list is essentially all just random URLs that used to exist five or 10 years ago, then you can pretty much assume that at least our algorithms th think there's nothing critical that we're missing here. So that's not something where you'd have to go through individually each URL to kind of double check to see that it's really gone. Uh, essentially, if we're showing a bunch of URLs that were important a couple of years back but are essentially gone since then, then that's a sign that we haven't found anything more important, which is usually good. And if you serve uh, uh, port 10 and Google still crawls them, how can you convince them not to crawl them again? Is there any way to make it stop, or is, isn't it? Um, you can block Googlebot's crawling with a robots.txt file, but that's probably not what you're trying to do. So essentially, if the URL exists on the server or existed in the past, then that's something we'll retry again from time to time. And that's not really something that you can block. All right, uh, let's grab another couple of questions here from the moderator page. And it looks like a bunch of questions in the chat as well. So I'll get back to those. Um, Zalando Guchain is one of the most competitive keywords in Germany. How is it possible for a single keyword domain uh, to rank like this? And a link to a search results page. Um, I don't know specifically what, what exactly that, that site is doing. But uh, generally speaking, I'd recommend if you think that they're doing something which is against the Webmaster Guidelines to let us know about that through a spam report so that we can kind of take a look to see what, what happened there. But uh, apart from that, usually we try to go through technical issues, especially with the website owner. So kind of like uh, analyzing why a certain site is showing the search results for someone else is not something that, that I tend to do. I just want to add to that, and Google's pretty good at that. So if it's a one page that's trying to spam, and I've seen it just off the wagon within like two weeks. So you guys are pretty good at that, hands down. <laughs> That's good to hear. Uh, I, I imagine there are some cases where we don't get it perfect, so it's always good to have uh, specific feedback. Um, but uh, specifically, if, if you think they're doing something which is spammy or you see something specific that they're doing that's spammy, then it's probably best to go through the spam report form. Uh, that way, the, the web spam team can take a look. All right, uh, a site was penalized because it had broken the Google guidelines about unnatural links. Does the algorithmic action refer to the whole domain or only to the old pages? Uh, new subpages can often be visible high in search results. Um, so usually things around uh, unnatural links, for example, are primarily site-based, so that's something where we think uh, if the website itself has unnatural links pointing to it, that's something we uh, take action on the whole website with. That's not something where we differentiate
differentiate between new and old pages. So that's not really something where you could say, oh, I'll just create some new pages and leave the old stuff there and hope that it gets kind of ignored on its own. That's really something where I try to clean up those problems as much as possible so that your new pages don't kind of start out with this anchor tied to their feet it's so that they can essentially uh, be active in the search results in a natural way. I was talking with a couple of persons and then told me that they uh, noticed a situation like this and that is why yeah, I put this question in the moderator. Um, it's really hard to tell without looking at specifics, but a lot of times uh, what I see is that a site might have some problems in some areas, but it also has a lot of good content on there. So we, we kind of have to balance that out some, somehow. And uh, what can happen is that a site shows up highly in the search results despite having all of these additional problems there, which essentially means that if it didn't have these problems there, it could be showing up even higher. So usually, I'd still recommend working to clean up those problems initially so that your new content really doesn't have to battle all of this old extra weight that's uh, kind of tying it down. Yeah, I have had a situation when a site with a manual penalty was visible in top 10. So this is what you are talking about, John. Yeah, that, that can definitely happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what can happen is that uh, there are just so many sites in a specific uh, niche that are already have a manual action on it that uh, essentially when we look at the search results, all of them have something kind of uh, attached to them and something tying them down. So in cases like that, um, what really helps is to just make sure that your site has those problems resolved as quickly as possible so that you can really uh, work forward and uh, kind of have your content rank naturally without any kind of natural action uh, attached to that. Um, Penguin is a is classified as an algorithm for dealing with web spam on websites. We all know that uh, it looks at spammy links. What other forms of web spam does it look like? Um, I'm not sure particularly what kind of specifics we've talked about before around uh, Penguin algorithm, but we do look at things like problematic links uh, w with this algorithm. So if you feel that your site is kind of affected by this specific web spam algorithm, I try to work on uh, really resolving those kind of link issues there and any other kind of web spam issues that you might run across. Um, in evaluating the quality of our website, what combination of metrics should we pay attention to in Google Analytics? Uh, what does a page with a high bounce rate and a high average time on page mean to Google? Um, I'm not such an expert on Google Analytics, and uh, we don't really use that for web search. So I don't really have any good answer for you there, Woody. Um, does any one of you guys want to kind of uh, chime in on Google Analytics, what kind of metrics you watch out for? Uh, well, I watch for the pages that are not doing that well. So uh, those pages you know, that are not doing that well, uh, I would replace them. How would you reckon? Um, through the traffic. Like, I just look at the traffic details, look at uh, all those kind of metrics. And, um, yeah, so most of the time, also, is the site more a mobile site or is the site, uh, you know, a desktop site? So we watch uh, a lot for that. And then uh, if it's a desktop site, we would remove the uh, mobile app or whatever because there's no point for it to be there. So those kind of stuff, I mean, and then... Uh, you know, there's more intense uh, things that obviously that I wa would watch out for. Every client's different, so. Okay. Any other tips for analytics? What to watch out for? No comments. All right. Someone has a dog in the background. I thought we have to have cats here in the Hangout. OK, 
Okay, we've identified some lower quality content on our site that we intend to improve. In the meantime, is it better to remove that content completely or just to mark it as no index? Uh, usually, what I recommend in cases like that is uh, to kind of ask yourself what you want to do with the content on this site in the long run. Is this something that you intend to improve significantly, or is this something that you think, oh, maybe over time I'll just uh, remove it completely, and based on that, make a decision? So if you want to improve it, and, or if you think that it's something that users, once they're on your site, might find useful, then using a noindex is fine. Uh, if that's something that you want to remove completely in the long run, then maybe it's worth just saying, OK, I'll just uh, clean this up as I find it and remove it immediately. Kind of watch out for internal links so that you're not leading users to a 404 page, but uh, kind of make the decision based on what you plan to do in the long run. So if you plan to improve it uh, significantly, as you mentioned in the question, then maybe using a no index is a good way to kind of get started. All right, uh, let me double check about uh, the questions in the chat. Um, does it help to put a link on a page where changes are found slowly? Uh, for example, tweet, hey, users, we have some updated content here, and uh, hope that basically Googlebot crawls it a bit faster. Uh, to some extent, you can do that if you want to. So for example, a lot of sites I've seen do that automatically on the home page and that they'll have a widget in the sidebar that essentially says, this is content that was changed frequent, uh, recently, or these are news or special things that uh, new products that are now available on your site, those kind of things. So that's something where, in a lot of cases, the architecture of a site kind of uh, tends to make that available naturally. So that that kind of gets picked up a little bit faster there. And if you don't have anything like that at all, where essentially some page on a lower level on your website can just change without anyone else uh, recognizing that on the rest of your website, then maybe adding some kind of a structure like that would be a good idea to make it at least easier for us to recognize that those pages change and that we can crawl and index them. You can also use a sitemap file for changes like that. Uh, with a sitemap file, you can include the last modification date, and based on that, we'll also try to recrawl that a little bit faster. Uh, May I ask a question here as well? Sure. Um, because I asked uh, um, in your um, Google Plus page for a site review, because if you add more content, why we didn't get more uh, traffic from that? So I was wondering if you have thousands of pages uh, with content, and uh, more content is added every day, why doesn't it result in more visitors uh, in the long run? Sorry, I, I missed the last part. So uh, if you add more content to your website, why doesn't it result in more uh, traffic from Google in the long run? Because you have more topics you cover, so you would expect to uh, gain more traffic about it? Um, to some extent, yes. But of course, we, we also look at the, the quality of the website overall. So just uh, generally adding a lot of extra content doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we'll see the, the quality of the website as being very high overall. And it doesn't necessarily mean that that's something we'll always show up in the search results. So for example, taking one page and splitting it off into two pages and saying, oh, these are two separate pages now with slightly tweaked content on each page doesn't necessarily mean that your website will have twice as much traffic. So that's something where you probably need to look into the specifics to really make sure that the additional content that you're creating is something that's really of high quality and something that we can crawl and index and uh, treat accordingly. So in many cases, um, we'll actually be able to crawl and index this content fairly quickly, especially if you're using a standard CMS or something where we can crawl through your website properly. So it's not so much a technical problem with regards to crawling, but more a problem with regards to understanding where this content should fit in with regards to the searches that people make and uh, in comparison to the rest of your website. 
can you have too much content to be crawled or uh, to be indexed, or that would sure. be the case? And how can you find the pages which are not interesting so you can uh, delete them? Because like, like we have a forum as well, and we have thousands of tens of thousands of topics. Um, should we remove the old ones, or should we keep them? Or um, it's hard Maybe. to determine the, the value of the content just by looking at it. Maybe. I, I think this is something that uh, you essentially have to look at on a per site basis, because you understand your site best, and you can figure out which maybe metrics you can add to your pages to understand uh, the value of these pages. So some people, for instance, uh, add these review stars where they say, oh, so please, users, rate my content. And based on that, you might be able to find out where you have like lower quality content overall. Um, other things that you could do is uh, look at your site's traffic to see where people are actually going within your website, look at which pages are actually getting links. Um, there are a variety of things that you can use on your side to kind of uh, drill down into areas where you know you have high quality content and where you know you have maybe lower quality content that you could take action on. And especially if you have a forum, it's something where with user-generated content, it's really hard to um, understand which parts are really high quality user generated content that you want to have your site known for, and which parts are basically just like chit chat among friends that you don't necessarily need to have indexed like that. So that's something where you might even make a decision and say, um, these specific categories are moderated really well, and this is something I think was really high quality. And uh, these other pages here are essentially things that are nice to have on my website, and users like to have them, but it's not something that you want to kind of be primarily found in Google for. So maybe no index, the, the section on chit chat, those kind of things. So would it also yeah. be wise to separate it on a different uh, subdomain as well, just because of that? Because it can influence the other content, because we have articles and we have a forum, and sometimes it seems like one section of the site influences the other section of the site. And it's hard to, for a user, it's easy to, to have it all on one side. But maybe for other uh, purposes, you have to separate it? Um, it's possible. That's, that's something that uh, y you can look into. Um, I think it's, it's always very tricky when you have a, a mixture of really high quality, uh, professionally made content, and uh, user generated content on the same website. So this is something that is sometimes kind of tricky. For example, if you have uh, user profile pages within essentially your main domain in a way that uh, any random user can create a user profile, it gets crawled and indexed, and maybe some of these are actually spam. And uh, when you combine that with your high quality content on the same domain, it's sometimes really hard to say, overall, on this domain, we have high quality content or we have lower quality content on average. So if you can separate out uh, those user generated uh, content areas a little bit, I think that sometimes makes sense and sometimes makes it a little bit easier for our algorithms to actually review the content individually. OK, thank you for that. Barry has a question. Can I ask, or I don't want to? Uh oh. <laughs> you can mute me if it works that way. Too. Um, okay, I'll ask since everybody's nervous. Now. So this is the thing going on in the I don't know, blogger world, where giveaway bloggers are all upset that an SEO told them the reason their blog or certain blogs are being penalized by Google was because of the comments in their posts, saying the comments you're allowing in your post are spammy, not with link spam, but just they, they're like one or two word responses, thank you, great post, um, I'll come back and read more, those types of you know, comments that people get. And because they have an overwhelming number of those types of comments, Google labeled their sites as being penalized because of their spammy comments. Um, one is I find that hard to believe. Obviously, if it's filled with garbage comments, that's one thing. And obviously, we discussed user-generated comments in the past. And I would think it has to be a significant number of poorly written comments with a lot of link, like links embedded in them, and some you know really like spammy posts 
um, in order for that to have an impact on a, a blog. Now, knowing that these are giveaway blog giveaway bloggers, uh, I assume the content itself, in general, are is somewhat uh, I don't know sketchy or not. I shouldn't say that out loud, but so I, you know, is it wrong for like people to give advice saying if you should disallow comments that are less than three words? I mean, sometimes. It, most of the time, it's probably not great quality content in terms of comments, but sometimes it could be like, yeah, that's great. Thank you for posting. So what, what would you say about that in, in a general way, like Google does? Um, so I don't think that's something that we would take any kind of manual or algorithmic action on based on the length of the comments that, that are left on a blog post. That's something I think you probably find other areas where, which are much, much more problematic on a website like that. But uh, generally speaking, if you allow just random comments without moderating them at all, then you kind of run into that problem of uh, people just posting spam or just being abusive on, in the comments and essentially not creating anything of value there. So if that's something that you're doing on your blog, that's something to watch out for, just because the, the quality of the website overall kind of goes down. But uh, essentially, if people are just leaving comments and saying, hey, this was a great post, then geez, yeah, that's, I, I guess that's, that's a good sign. That's not that bad. And uh, it's more problematic, really, if uh, basically people are just able to like leave links there uh, with a no follow, without a no follow on there, or if people just post just pure spam or just junk in the comments. So that's something you might want to watch out for. But just by having random people comment on your blog naturally, saying, "Hey, great post," that's that's not something we'd watch out for. Thank you. What about what about people like saying, in order for you to be partake in this giveaway, or to be, you have to say, comment on the blog post saying, "Yeah, I'm here. Include me." Like the whole Google Plus thing wasn't really. You had to generate something that was useful. Obviously, with the Google uh, Glass, you had to say, "You had to submit an entry." But let's say it was just just add your name here, and we'll go ahead and include you in our giveaway. Um, that too wouldn't. I don't think it'd be spam, right? But I. Don't see any big problems with that from a web spam point of view. Like I don't know if, if like Google Plus would have any guidelines on that. That's something probably different. Uh, but from a web spam point of view, if this is content that you want to have indexed for your website, essentially you're you're the webmaster of your website. So that's something so you, guys, you, you can choose. You guys would delete something like if I put uh, Mike and then I put my uh, pharmaceutical company and then I would do. You know, I would add like three sentences or something like that. That's something that you guys would penalize, right? Um, I don't, oh, you're from Canada, right? Yeah. Oh, these these Canadians. Okay. Um, I, I mean, if you just like uh, comment on a blog to drop a link, and that's something that uh, you're doing there because there's no no follow there, and your name is uh, Cheap Canadian Pharmaceuticals, then that looks kind of like an unnatural link, and that's something that our algorithms would probably be picking up. But uh, if you're just a, a normal person, you're posting there with your name and saying, hey, this was a great post, then that's, that's not really a problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see what else we have in the moderator list. Uh, if you're watching along, feel free to add more questions to moderator as well. Um, we'll try to get through most of these if we can. Uh, what's the best way to balance bounce rates for affiliate sites? Um, I don't know. That seems more like something specific to, to websites or analytics. Um, so that's something I probably don't have any insights to share on. Um, why, when using a site search, it says page is not an index, but if I search uh, some unique text on a page, it shows up? Um, that's probably something where you'd have to look at the specifics. Uh, one thing to kind of keep in mind is a site query, I think, uh, ignores things like URL parameters. So if it has parameters in the URL, then that might be something that you wouldn't see in the site query. But uh, I probably have to look at the specific URL. 
was reported some time ago that Panda was a site-wide penalty. Is this still the case? Uh, so Panda is our high-quality websites algorithm. Not really a penalty, but it is uh, primarily site-wide. Uh, if we delete all algorithm-affected pages, will the rest of the site rank fine? Um, usually, if you remove the lower quality content on your site, then that's something that uh, we'll pick up, and uh, the algorithm will update on that as well. But a lot of times, it's also the case that uh, there's not just some specific parts of the website with low quality content, but rather something significant and a general problem with the website itself. So that's something where you probably want to not just focus on individual pages, but also think of the bigger picture and try to figure out where you could find uh, other low quality content. And as always, especially with uh, the Panda algorithm, there's a great blog post um, that we did early last year, or maybe even a bit further back, with uh, 23 questions that you can ask yourself around high quality content, uh, which is something that I really recommend going through with someone who's not directly associated with your website to get some kind of neutral points of view around your website and how it might be perceived by users and our algorithms. Um, is it possible for a site which has never engaged in manipulative linking schemes to be negatively affected by Penguin? What should a site do that was wrongfully targeted? Um, I'd have to kind of double check the URL to see what, what exactly is happening there. But uh, essentially, if you think that any algorithm is incorrectly affecting your website, that's something you can let us know about. Uh, you can contact us directly on Google Plus, for example, and we'll forward that to the engineering team. That's not something where you generally get any kind of response from us because uh, we tend not to comment specifically on, on those kind of issues, but uh, we do like to pass those on to the engineering team to double check to make sure that things are working out as they should be. So since you included the URL here, I'll just forward that as well. Uh, disavow tool, at the time a user webmaster submits a reconsideration request, does the QR review the file or whatever it has been included for the disavow, or is this content used only by our algorithms? Uh, we use it for both manual action reviews and for our algorithms. So uh, if you submit a reconsideration request, then at that point we essentially look at your disavow file and uh, try to take that into account when we look at things like unnatural links. Um, is it better to have a long page titles with some duplicate page titles if a site has thousands of products and the page titles are generated automatically? Is it better to allow occasional duplicate titles or to add more information to avoid duplicates? Um, essentially, that's up to you. We do use the, the title to some extent in our algorithms, but we use a lot of other factors as well. So even if multiple pages on your site have the same titles, we'll still try to differentiate between them uh, when we review which page is the most relevant for a specific query. So if, uh, the, if you can provide good titles automatically, that's great. If some of those are duplicated, that's not so much of a problem either. Uh, in some cases, you just uh, kind of have to assume that our algorithms might even rewrite the title for the search results to make it a little bit clearer to the user what's actually going to be found on that page. Um, easy disavow format question. Just to confirm, does it have to be a text file with hard returns, or can it be a CSV file with comma-separated uh, values, or both? It has to be a text file with uh, normal enters between individual lines. How can a new site build trust in Google's algorithms? That's tricky, I guess. Um, essentially, Wait. yeah, go ahead. Create uh, good material. Yeah, I mean, be a great website, have great content is, is really the, the best way to kind of go forward on that. It's not something where you can essentially say, I'm going to include an XML file that says trust equals 1, and uh, up 
update it like that. So this is something that takes time. You have to have great content. Users have to kind of love your content, come back to it. Uh, they should recommend it to their friends. It should be something that is, on the one hand, technically easily, easily crawlable and indexable, and on the other hand, something that really users love to find in the search results. And when that happens, we'll, we'll try to pick it up accordingly. Oh, come on, Barry. <laughs> I saw you're not selling links anymore. Yeah, it's the new trend, I think. No follow tag, someone they introduced it recently. OK, yeah, that's awesome. PageRank also like just went through the roof. Not really, no. <laughs> what is it, six? That's not yeah, the roof. It used to six, be seven. seven. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was uh, an interesting timing question there with your side, anyway. Yeah, I figured that's <laughs> what, uh, I figured that's what happened. Um, I don't know if you were involved in any of the back end communications about that at Google, but that was uh, that was interesting. Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that even though you guys spoke about it, Google penalties, manual penalties expire after X time. I guess you set it and you say when it expires, and then you get a notification to check back later. And my penalty has probably expired probably at least four or five times since I had it. So everyone's like, oh, you, you know, your page rank flew up again. I'm like, well, give it a couple weeks. It'll go back down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I hope it sticks now. Um, let's see. Next question here. I received a link notice that said it was taking action on my backlinks only, but uh, then my crawl rate fell off dramatically afterwards. Uh, is that related? That's definitely not related. So the, the crawl rate and the crawling is usually something that's uh, due to technical uh, limitations there. It's not something that uh, would be based on things like uh, how we treat your links. Um, I have a quick slide on stuff that uh, kind of affects the crawl rate. Um, maybe we can take a quick look at that. So essentially, from our point of view, uh, one of the problems we have is that uh, we can't really crawl everything. So we know about a lot of URLs on, on a lot of sites, but we can't essentially just update that at the same time. Uh, we looked into that way at the beginning. Uh, with the slide with the different crawl rates on there. So there are essentially two sides that you can work on to kind of improve the, the crawl rate or the crawl coverage. On the one hand, you can improve the crawl rate, so how fast we actually crawl your server. On the other hand, uh, you can kind of decrease the number of URLs that we find so that we can crawl a little bit more efficiently. So if you have a lower crawl rate, uh, usually, that's either due to uh, setting in Webmaster Tools, where you can set the crawl rate yourself. Uh, one thing to kind of keep in mind there uh, with the crawl rate setting in Webmaster Tools is that it's a limitation. It's not something where you can say, I want to crawl faster and set it to a higher speed. It's essentially just a cap for us, so saying, don't crawl faster than this setting. Uh, usually, what happens is uh, the server or the network slows Googlebot down a little bit. And in very rare cases, there is a custom crawl rate set from our side that you'll also see in Webmaster Tools, where you have to use the contact form there to let us know about a different crawl rate. So when it comes to your server kind of slowing Googlebot down, uh, there are a few situations where we, we do slow are crawling down a little bit, on the one hand, when the response time is high, so the time it takes for Google to actually download the HTML page itself. So it's not uh, the same as the page speed, where, which is the time it takes for a browser to render your page, but actually just for the individual pieces of content. Uh, also, when the don't download speed uh, goes down, when it looks like your server is kind of struggling to keep up with the request, that's something where we kind of slow down our crawling. Uh, when we see a lot of server errors happen, that's also a case where we kind of slow our crawl rate down a little bit. And similarly, network errors, when those kind of things happen, then we also tend to slow down a little bit more. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind here is that this happens on a per-server basis. 
So it's not something that's specific just to your website, but also to other websites that are hosted on the same server. So if you're on a server that has 100,000 other websites on it, and some of those websites are significantly uh, kind of slowing or crawling down, then that can affect the, the crawling of the other websites there as well. So if you need to have Googlebot crawl as fast as possible, and you think that other sites on the same server are slowing the server down, then maybe it's time to kind of move to a more specialized server that doesn't have as many slower sites on it or even a, a server specific for your website itself. I did that for our clients, and oh, it's like 24 hours nonstop, just move everything to the new place, and then, uh, again, it happened. Um, the, the other one went down again. <laughs> Yeah, so specifically when we see website hosting changes, that's also a reason for us to kind of be a little bit more cautious. So when we see that your site moves to a completely different hosting infrastructure, then usually what happens is we'll slow crawling down a little bit just to make sure that we don't cause any kind of extra disruption. And as we recognize that things are working out well, then we'll kind of automatically speed the crawling up as well to kind of make sure that we're able to really use your infrastructure properly without, uh, at the first time, actually causing more problems than, than we're actually helping with. Uh, so response time, this is one graph from Webmaster Tools where you look at the crawl rate stats, where essentially you see here that uh, the response time really went up highly here, and uh, the crawl rate essentially dropped at the same time. And you can see the response time is going down again here. So what you probably imagine here is that over time we'll pick that up again and maybe over a month or so go back up to the old crawling rate as well. And how much was the delay again between uh, what you see in the uh, Webmaster Tools um, and actually crawling? How do you mean? Uh, how old is the, the graph you see in Webmaster Tools? Um, because this, I have some problems with crawling as well, but sometimes it takes it like a couple of days to a week. But how much is it exactly? I don't know. <laughs> you know? Um, the crawl stats are usually pretty up to date, so I imagine you'd see uh, the data there uh, anywhere from maybe one, two, or three days old to maybe a week at most. So. Usually, the crawl stats are something that's uh, really up to date as much as possible. But that's also something that you can kind of pull out from your own server logs as well, where if you can filter out the Googlebot requests, then you can create a similar kind of a graph for the number of URLs crawled. And you could even set up custom alerts on your side to say, oh, Google's bot, Googlebot's crawling has gone down 10%, so maybe I need to double check what's happening here. Um, another problem that's visible in Webmaster Tools that's not so visible directly in your server logs is connection errors. So these are times when we tried to crawl, but we actually couldn't get to your server. So those are situations where you might not even see the request in your server logs, where maybe the DNS server kind of didn't pick that up. Uh, maybe we couldn't get a good connection to your server. We sent a request to your network, but we never heard anything back, maybe a firewall or some kind of a DOS protection in between that's essentially blocking us from actually getting to your server. And that's something that you can see in Webmaster Tools specifically. That's also something that we tend to send out reports from Webmaster Tools if we recognize that this is something that uh, you might want to fix. And maybe you didn't even realize that somewhere in your network there's a firewall that's blocking Google from crawling properly. Um, the other problem, as I mentioned before, is that uh, sometimes we just find too many URLs, and we have a limited crawl rate available for your server, and we kind of get lost on all of the URLs that we find. Usually, that happens when we run into a lot of duplicate content. For example, a lot of uh, URLs with tons of different URL parameters that essentially have the same content. Um, that could also be infinite spaces, like calendar scripts or um, e-commerce sites that essentially have an infinite number of um, ways to kind of filter sorting out those kind of things can essentially also cause us to find a ton of URLs 
and uh, kind of get bogged down with trying to crawl all of those so that we can't pick up your main content anymore. Um, duplicate content is usually a part of that as well. So duplicate content, especially when it's within your website, is not something we'd uh, penalize a website for. That's not really a problem with regards to the Webmaster Guidelines, and that's definitely not something where we'd say, from a manual point of view, we need to take action on this. Usually, it's more of a technical issue, kind of similar to the crawl rate that I mentioned before, in that we find a lot of content or a lot of URLs that's essentially all the same content. So we waste a lot of time and energy trying to crawl all of these pages, but uh, we don't really get anything unique out of it. So we kind of uh, it takes a lot longer for us to actually pick up the, the real content that we want to find. And it's something that you can essentially solve on your side. So um, a few things worth mentioning there. I really recommend trying to work to avoid it as much as possible instead of trying to fix it. So if you're creating a new website or new, new e-commerce site or a new forum where you know that uh, through URL parameters, you can essentially create an infinite number of URLs, then it's better to try to fix that from the beginning before you actually put the site live. Uh, if you have to fix it afterwards, doing things like uh, 301 redirect is a great thing to do. URL parameter handling tool is something you could look into. RHEL Canonical can help us uh, to focus on the main URLs. And don't use robots.txt for duplicate content because essentially we'll find the links to that content, but we won't be able to crawl it, so we can't combine the signals that we have. And essentially, you kind of lose any links to those URLs. And uh, we might even end up indexing the URL without the content. Um, one last thing, I think, uh, about uh, rel canonical that's probably worth mentioning. Um, with rel canonical, keep in mind that it still needs to be crawled, and it might even be indexed. So if you're seeing problems that we're getting bogged down with crawling with the rel canonical, we still need to crawl those pages to actually see the rel canonical first. And uh, the way our pipeline works, essentially those pages with the rel canonical can get indexed, and they can show up in search results. And uh, it's primarily in a second stage that we then try to combine that with the chosen can canonical. So if you do a site query for those kind of URLs where a URL pattern where you know that you have a URL canonical set up, then essentially if it's a page, if it's a site that changes fairly recently or fairly regularly, then you'll see those URLs actually indexed in the search results. So just because you see them indexed doesn't mean that we're ignoring them. Um, it just uh, takes a while for those to actually kind of get combined with the chosen canonical. Uh, we did a blog post recently about some mistakes with the rel canonical. Uh, that's probably worth looking into as well. So primarily, it has to be in the head section. Uh, you should only have one rel canonical per page. Um, it should be pointing at an equivalent page with uh, primarily shared text on there. And uh, one thing we see very frequently is that it, it should use really like correct URLs, so not something that points to a 404 page or no index page, and it should be something that's really like a clean, absolute URL. Uh, one thing we see fairly regularly is people just saying that the rel canonical is www.example.com slash my page, but forgetting the HTTP part in the beginning. And essentially, that's a relative link to the current page and probably something that's not valid. So those are essentially the main points here when it comes to kind of crawling and indexing. John, can I step in with a question related to rel canonical? Sure. Um, it's, it's OK to use the rel canonical for parameter pages if you have a lot of uh, pages which use parameter parameters, and you don't want them indexed, but they might help at some point some users. It's OK to use the rel canonical to dri drive all those parameter pages on a main page without parameters. Um, if the content is uh, essentially the same, then that's that's fine. Yeah. Well, uh, well, if we speak about uh, real estate uh, websites, uh, the content won't be the same because if you choose a parameter, it will change the listed uh, information. But anyhow, it's you can find all those listings in the pages without uh, parameters. You know, but the parameters will 
explode the number of pages. Yeah, that's probably something where once you're sure that we're able to actually crawl to the individual listings, the, so the detailed pages, then I'd look into maybe using a nofollow on the, the links within those kind of listings so that we don't even discover any more of those uh, parameterized uh, pages with like a different sort or filter criteria on them. So I wouldn't necessarily go through and uh, try to rel canonical all of those pages that are kind of different to one primary page. I try to find other ways of kind of combining them with, with your primary or your preferred pages. Well, the, um, if, if, we, if it is to use the nofollow, it's difficult because those came through Ajax. You know, the sortings come through JavaScript, so it's, it's kind of impossible to use nofollow. Yeah. Um, one thing you might want to do is use the URL parameter handling tool in Webmaster Tools for that to kind of make sure to let us know that these are specific URL parameters that uh, you don't really need to have crawled and indexed. That might help. Um, the tricky part about using the rel canonical on pages that are essentially not equivalent is when our algorithms see that, they might choose not to follow that rel canonical at all. So they might assume that, oh, maybe there's a technical mistake here, and you didn't mean to put a rel canonical on here, because these two pages aren't really equivalent. Oh, I see. So it's better to use the, yeah, probably the best way is to use the parameter handling tool. Yeah, yeah. For things like that, I use the parameter handling tool. And uh, like I mentioned, maybe look into other ways that you can kind of make it so that we don't accidentally discover those URLs. Whereas if that's happening by Ajax, then it's already kind of hard for us to discover those URLs. But uh, with the parameter handling tool, that might be a way to kind of um, really nail it down and let us know that this isn't something that needs to be crawled and indexed. OK, thank you. All right, one minute left. One last question, or two, maybe, if they're fast. Did I confuse you all with my presentation? No, it was really good. OK. John, I have one question. OK. <laughs> I, I know uh, I, I passed it before. I want only to be sure, because I know that no follow do not pass a page rank. So what happens in this situation when you are cha changing uh, you are changing the name of a product. Uh, it's a it's a it's a store. A new URL is being created, and this URL has URL canonical to the previous to the previous one URL. Uh, in this case, I think it's not a good solution because there is no page rank passing and. Aside, if I'm changing the whole structure of the products, can drop in rankings. Yes. Um, so you could use the rel canonical instead of a redirect if you can't do a redirect on your site. So for individual URLs, I don't think that's a critical problem. Uh -huh. um, it still kind of passes the signals along as much as possible, similar to a redirect, especially if you can recognize that essentially these are equivalent pages or the, the same page. So if the URL changes and the content itself is the same, then that's perfect use for a URL canonical. But if a person clicks in internet on the previous version of uh, URLs, then he, sh he will see a 404 page. Um, if it points to a 404 page, yes, that would be problematic. And that would probably be something I, I tried to avoid as much as possible, because then you're essentially pointing someone to a 404 page, which isn't really a good user experience. So you mean, John, that if an old version of a page has a rare canonical, it's, it can be, yeah? It's not a big problem. So yeah. I have, uh, f for example, uh, a car B. Then I'm changing uh, this, uh, this URL for uh, a very special car B. And uh, the first version of, a, of, a, of this URL is still uh, 
in a structure of my uh, site, it can be seen there is uh, no meta tags, uh, no index follow, uh, but there is a canonical to the new version of an uh, URL. In that case, we would treat it similar to a redirect. So uh -huh. that's that's definitely possible, if, especially if the content is equivalent or the same. Content and is the same. Then the same. that's that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John. Okay. Then uh, thank you all for dropping by, and uh, I think we have the next ones lined up for Friday again. So maybe we'll see some of you then. If not, feel free to add questions to the moderator pages, and we'll go through those as well. Have a good week, everyone. Thank Just you, John. Say, you too. Bye. Bye. Nice evening. Bye.